News of the Times, Murderous Mondays, The Mysterious Case of Ellen Kittle. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are in Essex in 1938. Ellen Kittle, an attractive girl of 21, whose father is a landowner, has been charged with the murder of Elizabeth Kittle, her husband's first wife, who has been poisoned. Her husband, whom she marries within weeks of his first wife's death, is a labourer upon the landowning of her father. No shrinking violet, Ellen clearly takes control of the devastation that follows from the, from the untimely death of his first wife and his six children. This twisted tale of did she or didn't she gripped the nation with crowds of people attempting to get any seat within the courthouse. We take a look at the history, the crime and the aftermath of the accused murderess, Ellen Kittle, in today's episode of Murderous Mondays. We hope you enjoy the show. Background. William and Elizabeth Kittle, and there were many variations on the name in the papers, were married with six children. William worked as a farm labourer on the land owned by a man named Backhouse Wendon. The marriage between Elizabeth and William was, by all accounts, exceedingly unhappy. The eldest daughter and son had both moved out. The daughter, as she escaped into service, and the son to escape the fighting between his unhappy parents. According to the children's testimony, the father was constantly berating the mother, especially during harvest season. He claimed she was never out early enough to glean. His other complaints against her were that the house and the children were untidy. He was very often heard to wish his wife dead and had been known to beat her. One other aspect that arose would be her apparent lack of clothing. At her death, all that could be found that she owned were two old skirts. When questioned about this, William stated that he would buy her clothes and she would sell them. It was apparent that the children were all close to their mother. The Wendon Family Backhouse Wendon was a man of some means and influence within the community. His daughter, Ellen Wendon, described as an attractive lass of twenty, falls for William Kettle. What stands in the way of her happiness is Kittle's wife, Elizabeth. In October of 1871, Elizabeth Kittle and some of the children are in one of the fields owned by Mr. Wendon picking sloes. Whilst they are there, Ellen Wendon appears with a bottle of beer which she offers to Elizabeth and the children. Although an onlooker attests that it appeared that Ellen took a drink from the same bottle, the children all disagreed and said she had had none of the drink. Ellen departs, leaving the bottle with them. Ellen and the children become ill. Ellen returns with a second bottle of drink that is again shared between the children and Elizabeth. The children are again unwell, but Elizabeth is particularly unwell. Elizabeth becomes bedridden. Ellen is unusually solicitous in her care of the wife of one of their labourers, and Elizabeth becomes increasingly worse, eventually dying. The neighbours laying out of the body of Elizabeth notice cuts and bruises upon her buttocks and face. The doctor attending, a good friend of Mr. Wendon, does not remark upon her the usual cuts and bruises nor upon the unnatural illness of death that came upon her so suddenly. Upon Elizabeth's death, Ellen swoops in order everything associated with the bed to be cut up, burned and destroyed. Any evidence associated with Elizabeth is also destroyed. Within weeks, Ellen is the new Mrs. Kittle. 
The neighbourhood is in a frenzy and the body of Elizabeth is exhumed and tested. Arsenic is found within Elizabeth's system. Both William and the new Mrs. Kittle, Ellen, are arrested. After the inquest, the doctor's testimony is non-accusatory and non-descript and blames Elizabeth's death upon syncope and bloodless from the accident falling out of bed onto some pottery. The inquest itself is overseen by the new Mrs. Kittle's father, Backhouse Wendon. With the inconclusiveness of the inquest, a special magistrate sitting is called to assess the evidence and decide whether there is a case to be placed forward for trial. From the Essex Standard, the 19th of April, 1872, the Great Bromley Poisoning Case, Examination of the Prisoners. The magistrate of the Hendring Hundred Bench held a special sitting at the police court in Mistley on Tuesday for the purpose of commencing an investigation into the charge preferred against William Kittle and Ellen Kittle, his wife, of poisoning a former wife of the first-named prisoner at Great Bromley in October last. Long before the hour fixed for commencing proceedings, 12 o'clock, the gates of the police station were besieged by a large crowd of persons anxious to gain admission to the court. But owing to the limited accommodation within the building, it is only due to the authorities to say that they had made the most of the space at their command and that excellent accommodation was made for the representatives of the press. Not a tithe of them were able to get in. These unsuccessful ones, however, were content to remain in the immediate vicinity of the court, to gossip over and discuss the merits of the case after their own fashion, and to gather from anyone leaving the court occasional scraps of information as to the progress the inquiry was making. The prisoners, on being arraigned, were formally charged by the magistrate's clerk with having, on the 10th of October last, at the parish of Great Bromley, feloniously, willfully, and of malice aforethought, killed and murdered Elizabeth Kittle. The male prisoner is about 47 years of age, and the female prisoner has only reached her 21st year. She is an ordinary-looking country girl, and her infatuation for Kittle who, in addition to being so much her senior, has by no means an attractive exterior, can hardly be understood. Before paying attention to the evidence, they displayed the greatest nonchalance. Both were accommodated with seats. Mr. Pierce, addressing the bench, said, I appear for the prisoners, and they plead not guilty. The male prisoner was a married man, an agricultural labourer residing in the parish of Great Bromley, and he was in the employ of Mr. Backhouse Wendon, a farmer there. The female prisoner was now the wife of the male prisoner, and was a daughter of Mr. Backhouse Wendon, for whom the male prisoner worked at the time of the death of his former wife, and for whom he worked at the time of his marriage with his present wife, and for whom he worked at the time of his apprehension on the present charge. Elizabeth Kittle, whom the two prisoners were charged with having murdered, was a woman of about 37 years of age, the mother of six or seven children, and up to the time of her death living with the male prisoner, as she had done for some time previously on exceedingly unhappy terms. On Thursday the 5th of October last, the deceased woman was out with two or three of her children in the occupation of picking sloes in a field belonging to Mr. Backhouse Wendon. Up to this time, both her and her children were in perfect health. On the morning of that day, the female prisoner proceeded from her father's house to the field in which the deceased and her children were 
hoeing. She had a bottle with her, and she went to the deceased and her children, who put the bottle to their lips and appeared to drink, as also did the female prisoner. The latter remained with them about half an hour or so, and then left. In the afternoon she again went to the same field or to an adjoining one, where they all were, and they sat down, and the female prisoner was with them for some time, and ultimately they all left the field, the female prisoner proceeding home, and so did the deceased and her children. Whilst they were in the field, and before the female prisoner paid the second visit to them, they had all been sick, and a witness who would be called before the bench would tell them that at the time when the female prisoner was there on the second occasion, she got up from where they were all seated and proceeded a short distance from the deceased and her children, and she also appeared to be sick. As he had already stated, deceased and her children went home. They were all of them sick, and continued to vomit more and more, and that was the last time that Elizabeth Kittle, the deceased, left her house alive. On the following day, Friday the 6th, she was worse still, and on the succeeding day still worse than that. The female prisoner, Ellen Wendon, as she was then known, was rather constant that otherwise in her attention to the deceased, and she went backwards and forwards to her house several times, conveying to her gruel, maize corn puddings, and little nutritious articles of that kind. A medical man, Dr. Cook, was called in on Sunday the 8th and saw the deceased and prescribed for her, but she was gradually getting worse, and on the evening of that day a witness whom he, Mr. Jones, should call, having remarked to her that she thought she would not get better, she replied that nothing would do her any good, as she could not keep anything on her stomach and had not been able to do so since the previous Thursday, which was the day on which the female prisoner went to her and her family when they were hoeing and gave them some beer. After this, certain neighbours attended upon the sick woman, and one in particular, who would be called before them, who took her some gruel, when, after eating some of it, Elizabeth Kittle said, this is very nice. This tastes very different to some that Ellen Wendon brought me this morning. The same witness saw the deceased again about nine o'clock on the Monday evening. She then appeared to be sinking fast, as she could scarcely speak, and that was the last time that any of the persons whom he should call as witnesses or anyone else that those who instructed him were aware of ever saw the deceased alive. What took place in that wretched dwelling between nine o'clock that Monday night and one o'clock in the morning, they could not tell. But they could only show that at one o'clock the next morning the male prisoner went to a neighbour, Mrs. Kittle, who was not related to the accused and whose name was spelt differently, and, stating that his wife was dead, asked her to go and perform the necessary offices towards her. She told him that she would if Mrs. Starling, another neighbour, would come as well, but not otherwise. The male prisoner then went to Mrs. Sterling and asked her to go with Mrs. Kettle, and she consented. The two women went to the cottage, and on going upstairs they beheld a sight which probably would never be thoroughly effaced from their memory. On the wretched bed in that room laid the dead body. The woman, quite naked, and in that bed with that dead body were three living children, one of them a little boy, hugging his lifeless mother, persistently around the neck and unable, except by being taken away by sheer force, to be removed. The two neighbours proceeded to do what was necessary. 
He had stated that the deceased was quite naked. She had no nightdress or chemise or article of that description on, and no covering on the body but an old pair of trousers and an old skirt of the deceased. The two neighbours asked the male prisoners to get some wood and make a fire, and he asked them what they wanted a fire for, and they replied that they wanted some hot water to wash the deceased with, and so forth. On looking around the room, the woman saw a chamber utensil broken into several pieces, about a pint of blood on the floor, and all over the floor and on the bed there were unmistakable marks of vomit to a considerable extent, while a wash-tub in the room was nearly half full of similar matter. Some wood was at length obtained by the male prisoner, who stated that he had no chopper with him to chop it up, having lost it some time previously. He accordingly took out his knife, and with it cut up the wood for the purpose of making a fire. The women proceeded to do what was necessary to the dead body, one or two of the neighbours being kind enough to supply some body linen, and on removing the bed from off the bedstead, the two women discovered a chopper. The women expressed their surprise at finding such an article there, upon which the male prisoner remarked that it was the chopper he had lost, and that he had used it for the purpose of knocking the sacking on, and had forgotten where he had left it. Whether or not that chopper was used in any way towards the deceased during the interval between nine o'clock at night and the time when the neighbours were called in to see after the deceased's dead body, he, Mr. Jones, must leave entirely to conjecture. What took place during that interval they did not know. All they could say was that there were wounds on the dead body, on the deceased's buttocks, and also across the nose was a sharp cut, which the male prisoner accounted for by stating that the deceased had got out of bed and while sitting on the chamber utensil, it broke and caused the wounds upon her buttocks. That she then fell forward and knocked her nose against the bedstead, and that she then fell under the bed, that on finding her in this position, when he awoke, he lifted her up and laid her on the bed. Early next day, or at any rate comparatively early, the female prisoner made her appearance on the scene. She went down to Kittle's house, and at once took upon herself the position of mistress there. She gave direction and orders, and acted in a way that one would have supposed that was she was a near relative of the deceased, or of the male prisoner. She gave to one witness who would be called the bed or beds upon which the deceased had laid, and told her to burn the ticking, adding that the male prisoner wished her to do so, and they both wished her, the witness, not to say anything about it. The witness did take the beds and burnt the ticking. The female prisoner then commenced to cut up the bedstead, and with the assistance of other women who helped her, by expressed directions, the bedstead was cut up, thrown out of the window, and ultimately burnt. An inquest was subsequently held upon the body of the deceased woman, and he, Mr. Jones, was told that an open verdict was returned. The male prisoner sought to obtain a certificate of the cause of death before the inquest was held. The male prisoner applied to the medical man for a certificate of the cause of death in order that he might take it to the registrar and obtain an order of burial, and upon the representation he then made, Dr. Cook gave him a certificate, and Kittle took it to Mr. Sargent, the registrar of deaths for Bromley. In the meantime, the police constable had summoned Mr. Sargent on an inquest on the deceased body, and he thereupon declined to give the male prisoner an order for burial, 
and Dr. Cook subsequently obtained back from the male prisoner the certificate he had given him as to the cause of death, and which he immediately cancelled, and the death was ultimately registered on the certificate of the coroner. He had already stated what took place as to the female prisoner, and the management she took in the male prisoner's household immediately upon the death of the deceased, and he should show that upon the day of the funeral the neighbours went into the house and offered to do what they could towards getting the children ready for the funeral, upon which the female prisoner, who was washing some of the children, said she did not want any of their assistance, and that she could attend to them herself, and she did so. As to the pillows upon which the head of, of deceased had laid, he was in a position to show that they were buried in the privy, probably by the female prisoner, and that they were shortly afterwards conveyed with the soil on to a muck-hole of Wendon's, and in November, when the land was being ploughed for wheat, some feathers were ploughed in, and that was how they got rid of the pillows. As to the only two dresses the deceased had, he was instructed that the male prisoner's mother washed them and took them away. That got rid of all the articles of wearing apparel, and the bed and bedding from the deceased's house. The funeral was on the 17th of October, and shortly afterwards, on the 13th of December, the male prisoner went to the superintendent of registry at Manningtree, and there gave notice of his intention to marry the female prisoner, and two or three days afterwards they were married, and they had since been living together up to the time of their apprehension on the present charge. He would show them also that although the female prisoner Ellen Kittle appeared to the deceased woman Elizabeth Kittle to be bland and kind and conveying to her, as the deceased had a right to suppose at all events, articles of nourishment, behind her back and even on those very days when she visited the cottage and took her the nourishment, she was speaking of the deceased as an old bitch and wishing her in fire, and things of that description. Moreover, between the death of the deceased and the funeral, she wrote a letter to one of the witnesses requesting that she would make up some trousers, for which she sent the cloth for the male prisoner to wear at the funeral of his wife, and in that letter she said the deceased was a wretch indeed. Prisoners' statements towards the deceased did not entirely rest upon the female prisoner's words, but there was her own writing at that period showing the sort of feeling which she entertained towards the deceased, and which appeared to him to contrast strongly and strangely with the course of conduct she appeared to be adopting. He should also show that Previous to the death of the deceased, the female prisoner, referring to Kittel, said she would marry him and that he was the man she meant to have and she should be married to him before Christmas. He should further show that before the death of the deceased, acts of very great familiarity indeed were taking place between the two prisoners and that both before and after the woman's death both prisoners were making inquiries of witnesses as to the effect of poison upon a human being, and as to whether, after death, the doctors could find it out, and so forth. With regard to one event in particular, he should show that the female prisoner said she should have thought that, having vomited so much as the deceased had done, if she had taken any poison, it would all have been thrown up and could not have been found. He should show them by the male prisoner's own relatives, by his own children, that he 
and the deceased lived together unhappily, that he had over and over again expressed a wish that she was dead, and other remarks would satisfy the bench, he thought, that there must have been complicity between the two prisoners. Having made these opening remarks, he should proceed to call the witness, and having done that, he thought the magistrate would be of the opinion that there was such a prima facie case laid before them as would not only warrant them but call upon them to send the case for investigation elsewhere and to trial. He continued that he should be able to show that in the month of June or July last, the female prisoner asked a cousin with whom she was staying to have some arsenic made up for her for the purpose of destroying vermin, and it was made up and delivered to her. The stomach and intestines were conveyed to Professor Stevenson of Guy's Hospital, who would tell them that he had found unmistakable traces of arsenic, more than sufficient to cause death of an adult, and his examination was made some months after death. With regard to the effusion of blood from the deceased and the quantity found upon the floor, Professor Stevenson had examined the viscera with a view to test whether there was any reason to suppose that the woman's death arose from hemorrhage, and he would show conclusively that death did not result from hemorrhage, and he would also state as a scientific witness that he could find no trace of anything which would account for the death of the deceased except the arsenic, which he did find in unmistakable proportions. From here, Mr. Kittle's children are brought in to testify and confirm the day of slow picking in the fields and the unexpected appearance of Ellen Wendon, who brought some beer with her. They continue to confirm that all were indeed sick, having, having drunk from it. Twelve-year-old Maria Kittle continues that Ellen returned a second time with a different bottle of beer, which looked and tasted different from the first. She continues that Ellen did not drink out of either bottle. Maria testifies that only those who had drunk some of the beer brought in by Ellen Wendon had become ill. The sloes that had been picked were eaten by the other children at home, and they had not become ill. The inquest. From evidence related to the inquest, there was some cause of concern regarding the validity of the inquest that had taken place. The foreman of that inquest was Mr. Backhouse Wendon, the father of the prisoner, Ellen Kittle was Wendon. Discrepancies regarding the wounds sustained by the first Mrs. Kittle are brought forward, but the doctor who had seen the body states adamantly that he could not see much due to the poor lighting and the upset that everyone felt at the time of her death. He confirms that on the day of her death he saw the wounds upon her body but he did not examine them. With the exhumation, the wounds on the body could be seen, but the body by this time was so much decomposed on the lower portion of the body that it was difficult to ascertain exactly what type of wounds they were. Even with the highly circumstantial evidence against Ellen, she is found guilty and will be brought to trial. William Kittle, however, is cleared of any charges and is a free man, the case being considered far too weak to proceed against him. However, although William has escaped the law, the locals have a different view of things. From the Suffolk Chronicle, the 11th of May, 1872, another phase of the great Bromley poisoning. A contemporary reports the following occurrences which reference to the man Kittle, whose wife was a few weeks ago committed for trial on the charge of poisoning his former wife, and who was himself discharged 
by the magistrates. Notwithstanding the difficulty Kittle experienced effecting his escape from the police court at the close of the magisterial examination, he vested to pay another visit to Mistley on Thursday week. In the course of the morning, news was brought by a party who had driven from Elmstead that Kittle was on his way to Mistley with a wagon load of corn for a Mr. W. Brooks. The intelligence was speedily noised abroad, and on further inquiry being made, it appeared that Kittle was to convey back to Bromley a load of manure from the stable yard of the White Horse Inn. Over the entrance to the stable in question is a suspended beam, and a bright idea seemed to have struck some village wag as to the use which the said beam might be applied. Meanwhile, the intended victim, William Kittle, all unconscious of the preparations being made for his reception, was quietly wending his way along the road from Bromley, in due time he arrived at Mr. Brooks's granary and was permitted to unload his wagon in comparative quietude. But he was not long allowed to remain free from molestation, for his wagon, himself and mate, once snugly ensconced in the white horse yard, the attacking force commenced operations in thoroughly good earnest. It was just eleven o'clock, and the men at work on the quays and granaries being at liberty for a few minutes, a large crowd speedily assembled. Stones, brick bats, bags of flour, offal, and rotten eggs were hurled into the stable in profusion. Indeed, one would not have imagined that such a malicious and apparently inexhaustible collection of missiles could have been gathered together in so short a time. Men and women appeared to vie with each other in hurling projectiles and epithets, not too complimentary at their unfortunate victim, who sheltered between the tailboard of the wagon and the manure heap. Give a dog a bad name and hang him is a well-known saying, the force of which was ludicrously amplified on this occasion. At the entrance of the yard, a capital imitation of a gallows had been extemporized. A rope with a slip noose had been suspended from the aforesaid beam, and together with a bottle said to have been the same exact counterpart of that exhibited at the police station, and also an old rusty billhook. Nor were candidates wanting to fulfil the office of Calcraft, had the opportunity offered itself. But when the wagon emerged into the yard, the rope was thrust on one side, and Kittle covered himself with a sack, and he escaped the greater portion of deluge of lime wash which had been specifically prepared for his delectation. It is said that two tradesmen of the place who were present offered half a barrel of beer a piece to any men who would undertake to duck Kittle in the fountain or the river, but no one could be induced, even by this tempting offer, to accomplish so hazardous an enterprise, or to perpetrate so serious an outrage on the majesty of the law. In the midst of the hubbub, there arrived on the scene Mr. D. Mustard, solicitor and clerk to the magistrate, who, fearing that a serious breach of the peace might ensue in the then excited state of the crowd, immediately sent for the police. But when the blue-coated gentleman arrived, the commotion had begun to subside. As the wagon proceeded through the street, it was followed by men and boys, who continued to hurl brickbats and stone. The History of Events Elizabeth Kittle becomes unwell during the slow picking on the 4th of October, 1871. She dies on the 10th of October, 1871. 
Ellen Wendon marries William Kittle in December 1871, and Ellen gives birth to William's child in July of 1872. And the trial of Ellen Kittle is halted midway with the birth of her child and postponed until October 1872 for its conclusion. From the Taunton Courier and Western Advertiser, the 30th of October, 1872. Remarkable trial. A very remarkable trial, namely that of Ellen Kittle for the murder of her husband's former wife, has just been concluded at the Crown Court in Chelmsford before Baron Martin. The facts of the case may be thus stated. In the parish of Great Promley near Manningtree in the county of Essex, there lives a certain Mr. Wendon who occupies a small farm, but who appears to be only in humble circumstances. He has, amongst other children, a daughter named Ellen, who was at that time we referred to about twenty years of age and is spoken of as being rather good-looking. About half a mile from the farmhouse there is a small cottage tenanted by one of the Wendon's labourers named Kittle, a middle-aged man married and having several young children. It is clear, however, that he had a most uncomfortable home and was very unhappy with his wife. Strange as it may seem, a strong attachment had grown up between the bright young girl of twenty and the farm labourer and it appeared in evidence scandal was early whispered about the village in reference to them. On the fifth day of October 1871, Kittle's then wife and children were engaged in the fields, and after eating slows, became very sick and unwell. The children, however, recovered, but the wife rapidly grew worse, and by the following Monday the ninth was evidently in a highly dangerous state. Money had already been given to procure her necessary nourishment by Wendon himself. And on that day, Monday, the girl Ellen Wendon is known to have taken a basin of warm porridge to the dying woman. At one o'clock in the night, that woman was found dead. She had fallen, it would seem, on an earthenware vessel at the bedside. It had broken beneath her and cut her so seriously that the medical man certified death to having resulted from syncope and loss of blood. To this opinion he still adheres. Immediately after the wife's death, Ellen Wendon took charge of the household, gave orders about the funeral, and so soon after the next December he actually married the man Kittle. Previous suspicions were now more thoroughly aroused. The police took up the case, the body was exhumed, and a post-mortem examination was made. The result showed the existence of a sufficient quantity of arsenic in the stomach of the deceased to have caused her death, and it was beyond doubt that Ellen had had arsenic in her possession at the time of the woman's illness. Had she administered it with the intention of causing death? On this charge she was sent for trial, and the case came on at the summer assizes. But the prisoner being overtaken by pains of labour, it was postponed until now. It was clearly a case of circumstantial evidence, and in Seeking for sufficiently strong motive, Mr. Pollock, QC, for the prosecution, advanced the hypothesis that improper intimacy had taken place between the prisoner and the man Kittle previous to the death of his first wife, and to shield herself from future dishonour, the girl of about twenty years had poisoned the woman in order that she might marry the husband. Mr. Sergeant Parry made an eloquent appeal in her defence, and the jury, giving the prisoner the benefit of any doubt, pronounced a verdict of acquittal, and she was instantly 
discharge. It is worthy of note that a mode of destroying life which in former ages was the safest and the surest is now, through advances of medical science, the one most likely to lead to the detection of the murderer in consequence of the ease with which the traces of poison are discoverable. Ellen is found not guilty and is acquitted. Whether it was due to the exceptional circumstantial nature of the case, or sympathy with the new mother, or the delay of the trial, or the influence of her father, or a combination of all these factors, is hard to say. The neighbourhood takes it ill, and the papers are not that complimentary either. Their take is the exceedingly poor medical testimony as being the main flaw of the prosecution. From the Newry Reporter, the 31st of October, 1872, the case of Ellen Kittle. The Times concluded an article on the case of Ellen Kittle, the woman just acquitted of the charge of poisoning her husband's first wife, as follows. The case will remain one of the most curious instances of what may be called circumstantial suspicion. In the first instance, the husband was very naturally arrested with the prisoner, but there was no evidence against him, and he was discharged by the magistrates. Perhaps the most unfortunate part of the affair is that the doctor only saw the woman once. It was not his fault, for he was not called in before, but he had not sufficient opportunity to observe the symptoms. Five grains of arsenic do not find their way into a sick woman's stomach without someone having administered them, and when they have been swallowed they do not remain perfectly inoperative. The evidence, in a word, failed to explain the facts, but the facts are too clearly indicative, at least in intention, of foul play. It was impossible that a woman should be convicted of murder merely because a certain death in which she was interested might have been caused by poison, and she might have administered it. And because there was no evidence to show that anyone else had, yet this was really all that could be sustained by the prosecution. Some evidence was offered relating to certain packages of arsenic obtained from the police, but at these packages could not be traced to the prisoner it was excluded. The case seems to have been clumsily conducted more than one way. The question, for instance, whether the woman died from syncope might have been partly elucidated by an inspection of the heart, but this was not examined. The character of the relations between the discharged prisoner and the man Kittle remains unaffected by the acquittal. Such grossness is, we trust, exceptional, but that such a transaction should be possible in a metropolitan county affords matters for melancholy reflection. The couple do not make the news after the acquittal, and the case remains a mystery as to who killed Elizabeth Kittle. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, the mysterious case of Ellen Kittle. We very much hope you enjoy the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. 
On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.